uh, persons who are involved with this organizing this uh, brick meeting and uh, as he said uh, not only this time um, i think it is my good luck that i'll be organizing not only this euro asia in south but also the next national conference also in south and uh, that will take place in kochi and uh, euro asia is in the month of uh, june so book your dates it is it will be 20th 20 20th will be workshop 21st 22nd and 23rd of june so book your dates and <laughs> you must attend i think uh, you will be much benefited okay so <clears throat> now we start so this is the last talk i think i i can take a privilege of 2 3 minutes extra there is no problem because i have to go through the whole paradigm of this uh, antifungal therapy to understand this optimization business because optimization is something which uh, really carries lots of importance whenever you talk about antifungal therapy because you should keep all these things in your mind whenever you are taking care of such patients who require antifungal different types of uh, patients who are uh, requiring antifungal therapy so <clears throat> basically what we are dealing with the invasive fungal disease and uh, invasive fungal disease we all know that uh, they mostly affects the critically ill immunocompromised uh, having complex underlying disease uh, and those patients who are having significant morbidity mortality and costs and when we talk about optimization so optimization includes all these things that is diagnostic tools reducing cost of antifungal agents stewardship program combination therapies immune therapy modulation immune modulation and uh, then you need to control the resistance uh, vaccinations vaccines are also coming so all those things you have to keep in mind so i'll just uh, go through a brief glimpse of all those things uh, what is happening in the entire world as far as all these things are concerned so all these points will cover one by one so first of all let us start with who world health organization so they started a campaign they said we want to improve the outcome for patients with fungal infections across the world and they made a road map for the next decade and uh, what they started they started finding the major gaps in diagnostic challenges so they thought found that uh, there is a lack of point of care testing methodology there was um, uh, lack of serological assessment all re laboratory related things they found there is a huge gap rapid test for azole prognostic test risk stratification all those things were lacking in the entire world and uh, then they also found major gap as far as treatment is concerned the drugs were not available then obviously the kind of drug which is required was not available so there are so many things which was there so they made a plan short term plan one two three and i'm not going to the details of all those you can see it is there in the internet so they made is make made a short term plan of one to three years then they made a mid term plan of three to five years and then finally six to ten years so they are supposed to deliver everything by because it has started in 2013 they are supposed to deliver everything this year 2023 but still i am waiting that uh, what has happened we still do not know and nothing has come out till in 2023 from who probably it will come next year we'll see what is happening so where we are currently we need to understand what exactly we have achieved as as an intensivist or critical care specialist we can understand that at least we have understood and we have started thinking about fungus so our prompt thinking has made us uh, forced to start antifungal therapy at least based on risk factors and on the basis of that that is why we have started this prophylactic and preemptive business many a times empiric therapy is was common but prophylactic and preemptive therapy also we have started taking care of and then we have started thinking about the appropriate choice of antifungal therapy based on whatever laboratory finding or short term tests which we are getting and radiology based diagnosis like aspergillus mostly we diagnose on the basis of radiology if we do not have those facilities and obviously with the help of infection control programs we have been able to control the infection but uh, <clears throat> when we talk about fungal diagnostics although if you look at the world scenario or you go to the western world lots of development has taken place but what is happening as far as our country i don't see when the 5% of hospital have got those facilities 
so access to the advanced diagnostic technique is a major challenge and that is why we are lacking behind in the especially in the developing countries and it remains a potential issue which needs to be addressed and uh, it doesn't needs to be addressed at our level but obviously we can discuss because it has to be communicated to somebody who are actually the stakeholders for this so for critically ill patients because this is a forum critical care we are talking about critical care there are factors when we when we start treating these patients we see many things in our icu like clinical stability of the patient previous antifungal exposure colonization now indexes although we are not using so much but we think about that local epidemiology site of infection then concurrent medications morbidity organ failure therapeutic drug so there are so many things which comes to our mind and uh, these are very important when the patient is critically just now pkpd was being discussed pkpd also varies with the pathophysiological changes which takes place after a patient is go going into multi organ failure the whole pkpd will change so the pkpd formula has been developed in animals and then it has been tested in humans in normal subjects but if you talk about abnormal subjects a patient with has got a multi organ failure you will get a different pkpd so it changes with the the pathophysiological changes which happens in the body and that is how it uh, uh, it needs to be decided but at least we need some basic formula to guide our uh, therapeutic regimen now the most important thing as i said is antifungal resistance we all know that azoles azoles are the backbones of all the antifungal therapy because these are cheaper they have got a wide range of action they cover almost everything but the worst part is their toxicity we are not going to talk about that part but they develop resistance because what happens the, these fungus when you use too much of azoles they ergosterol the a synthesis because this azoles work on ergosterol so what happens they stop synthesizing this ergosterol so if ergosterol is not there in cell membrane the antifungal agent will not work and this is how they take the defense as far as the kinokinins are concerned what they, they make their walls thick and they don't allow this uh, the fungus uh, the antifungal agent to penetrate the wall and that is why kinokinins don't work then efflux pump is an important thing and obviously there is an alteration in cell membrane permeability also creates this polyene antifungals not to act and uh, as far as uh, pyrimidines are concerned they inhibit or there is no inhibition of dna rna synthesis so they fail to act on this dna rna because they work they mainly act on this area of uh, any fungus so the use of same drug class we use it in agriculture also the same antifungal agents they are used in veterinary science also and they are used in human beings also this is one of the major reason why this problem has happened this fungal antifungal resistance we talk only about human beings but agriculture is using too many antifungals to protect their crops and that is why future antifungal development should diverge or whatever we are doing from between agriculture pharma and pharma which is used for human being so this needs to be separated because that is one of the major reason and that has been actually given by uh, itsa as well as uh, uh, who and what they said what we need so we need a stewardship program where at the environmental level we need an a stewardship program at the patient level we are already doing but uh, not only stewardship also good surveillance programs at all level at agriculture at veterinary at human beings so everywhere we need good stewardship program and surveillance program at national and international level and that is going to prevent all these resistances now just now tdm was being talked and this is very important for certain drugs like posaconazol voriconazol itraconazol and flucytosine pyrimidine analog these are very important and tdm monitoring just now uh, harish was telling that yes it is important obviously because they have got the swinging effect so we do not know when this drug is going to so we measure the trough levels of this drug so that this can be very effective and one of the major backbone of our icu therapy is voriconazole we are using too much and voriconazole is one on drug 
which uh, has got which is it, it is double edged sword on the uh, one hand its therapeutic benefit on the other hand its toxicity so you have to balance between that and that is why tdm is very important so this is another way how we can optimize our antifungal therapy now novel drug development we always say we should have something new we should have something new but i tell you the story the problem you see if we want to use one drug for some other thing that is repurposing it takes almost 3 to 12 years to develop to, to go to that stage and if you are researching with some new molecule it takes almost 20 to 25 years and uh, the amount of cost which is involved it is in millions of dollars so it may, may go up to 1800 million dollar for one some drug to be developed so i give you some of the examples like Basilia and Estellas, they have developed this Crescem by Subuconazole. We have now started using it. You know how much they have spent? They have spent $100 million in 13 years and then they have come out with Isabuconazole. And what about, there is a one drug which is yet to come. It is going through phase two trial and this is from F2G Limited. It has started, the research work started in 1998 and this uh, Olorofim has yet to come into the market. It is almost 24 years down the line and they have invested almost $213 million, but still it is not in the market. So just imagine how much time it takes. So new drugs, always it looks very fascinating, but the time which it takes is so much and the cost which it takes, it is really taxing. So there are a few more which are about to come. So new strategies for delivering antifungal drug, this is another method. A opelconazole, this is one new drug which is coming that can be given in the form of inhalational therapy. So you can optimize by avoiding IV or oral therapy, obviously intranasal therapy or inhalational therapy is going to be a good option. So probably in future we'll get this drug and it will help in our optimizing our antifungal therapy. Then widespread prophylactic and empiric pres empirically prescribing antifungal to treat invasive fungal disease in individuals who are chronically ill, those who are having hemato-oncology problems, effective antifungal stewardship. So stewardship, I, I understand all of you because all of you are working in different corporate hospitals. Stewardship is one thing which actually helps. But uh, when we did a survey in the entire country, how many hospitals has got a successful stewardship program? but there are very few who are actually running it in a proper serious manner. So stewardship obviously can help a lot, but the implementation of stewardship program is really difficult. And why we do it? To improve outcome, to avoid adverse event, reduce emergence of resistance, rapidly diagnose fungal tree and control. Cost containment is another important thing. And uh, there are few important things which are important as far as stewardship is concerned, like essential things achievable things and aspirational activities so what we can do for essential which we need to do is that you should have a policy for antifungal therapy you should have targeted educational program you should have you should have know the drug drug interactions then when to transform oral therapy iv therapy to oral therapy so those kind of things small small interventions are very very important then there are something uh, few things which can be achievable at your level or at your institute like you have a di rapid diagnostic tools you have timely antifungal susceptibility methodology in your laboratory Tra you follow the trends of antifungal susceptibility if you get it from microbiology lab what kind of susceptibility like antimicrobial what we are getting but for not for antifungal most of the laboratories they don't provide antifungal then autopsy reports, PGI Chandigarh is one of those, those who are reading autopsy reports and they came out with a, one of the study, they said pancreatitis, you know, in acute pancreatitis, 3 to 4% of acute pancreatitis cases are because of candida. Probably it is a surprise for you, but it has been investigated in PGI Chandigarh. So they are doing all those things. And uh, obviously this aspirational methodologies like surveillance system, risk assessment, point of care microbiology tests, all those things, they are again important for. So ultimately, there are many performance measures which actually we go through for a stewardship uh, program. But ultimately, what is our final goal? Our final goal 
is to improve outcome of the patient. And these are all intermediate outcomes which actually measure whether your stewardship program is successful or not. So stewardship is one of the backbone measures where you can actually use to optimize your antifungal therapy. Now come to a very important thing, combination. How many of you are using combination therapy? Can you, any, any, any hand, anybody is using combination therapy? Antifungal? Nobody is using it, okay? Why? Because we are scared. We do not have any literature, but uh, it has been found that combination therapy works at many places, although it has not come in guidelines, but there are many studies which is coming out and this principle was established long back in 1950 which started with tuberculosis and then HIV infection and later on it followed through and now it is coming in antifungal as well. So <clears throat> how it came in antifungal? It started with Mika fungin when they found that when we combine Mika fungin with uh, azoles, it gives a good outcome in patients who are having uh, resistant kind of infections. So these are the rational which suggests why we should combination. It increases the response rate, it decreases the mortality, it broadens the spectrum of cover, it does reduce toxicity, reduction in duration of therapy and prevention of resistance. So these are the few major points and some of the studies which has given that these are the combinations which may be helpful for different kind of infections, a combination therapy like in cryptococcosis, invasive candidiasis and invasive aspergillosis. It is a well published uh, article but uh, obviously we are yet to see something which comes in the guidelines and these are some of the studies. So there are very few evidences in favor, however many reports suggest that it works with difficult to treat organisms. And although it is not a universal principle, we have to be careful with pre-KPD and drug interaction uh, uh, pro problems which can happen with the use of uh, these combinations. And poor outcome from invasive disease are primarily due to compromised immune system and its inability to respond appropriately despite antimicrobials. So this has led to the exploration of noble therapeutic modalities and we'll see what are the noble therapy because we are talking about optimization and this is what we target the immune system of the patient so how to improve the immune function so again we come to the same that is the personalized medicine or precision medicine approach that targets the compromised immunity through immunotherapies or vaccines against invasive fungal disease and this is what is coming up and this is what we are going to see in future because this is important so what we have in hand we have cytokine therapy we have granulocyte transfusion we have adaptive t-cell transfer antibodies natural killer cells vaccination so all those things they are in pipeline i'll show you and as far as studies are concerned, there are many published studies. If you see the literature, so what are the roles of neutrophils, what are the roles of dendritic cells, monocytes, macrophages, how they work. Then interferon gamma, that has also shown a very promising result in uh, this. Then cytokine therapy and uh, yeah, their use in, uh, and uh, not only that colony stimulating factor, but also granulocyte colony stimulating factor, macrophage colony stimulating factor and interferon gamma have explored as immune enhancing agents and they have shown many promising results in different studies. So and these are some of the studies, I am not going to the detail of this because of paucity and I, this is beyond the scope of this lecture also. But uh, you, you can find out and uh, you can always uh, see this natural killer cells again this is another important thing which is uh, coming up and they have resulted in rapid clearance of aspergillus from the lungs of many patients so what is the status so there are many immune enhancing agent and they work as an adjuvant to different kind of antifungal therapy so these green ones what they saw this uh, cytokine therapy yellow is cellular therapy orange one is monoclonal antibodies, blue one is other immunotherapic agents and the peach color is the promising future therapies. So from bench to bedside, as I said, it takes almost many years. It uh, almost, now we are working on it for more than 20 years, but uh, currently we do not have anything definite as far as direct use at the 
a patient bedside is concerned we are not using anything directly but uh, these things are there on the pipeline and probably in future they will help in optimizing this antifungal therapy what about vaccines vaccines are there so advances in our understanding of host defense pathogenic mechanism underlying fungal infections they have supported development of different vaccines so for most active study they have shown that cell mediated pro inflammatory th1 and th17 response which improve phagocytic killing of the fungus if we enhance them inside the body so two promising fungal vaccine one the first one is that prevents fungal adhesion and invasion in immuno compromised host or immunized host and the second one those who, who has, which has got an immunogenic and harmless sap2 antigen that induces systemic and 100% mucosal protective immunity so these two vaccines are probably i think in near future in another 5 years they'll be there uh, you can see it in the market so studies also have shown that recombinant protein antigen from aspergillus can induce type 1 mediated immune response and that will be effective against aspergillosis and also some crude antigen preparations from aspergillus fumigators have been tested and they have found that improved survival in animals so in case of cryptococcus the lots of work has been done and that is also i think in another 3 to 5 years is going to the market and live attenuated mutant strain like a uh, sterol glucoside glucosidase enzyme as a vaccine and that uh, is working for uh, this cryptococcus neoformans and cryptococcus gatti because gatti as you saw that there is an outbreak in north america recently so that is also a challenge but not in our country but to western world it is obviously a big challenge now what is happening recently as far as because we always follow the west we do not have anything in us so what is happening in the west so here there is a federation that is confederation that is called european confederation of medical mycology that is ecmm and it was established in 1993 so they did a meeting in very recently one or two years back and they said that we want to disseminate our knowledge and uh, our educational programs and whatever we are doing to the entire world so they made this confederation of the 23 countries now they are expanding to the entire world and they say that uh, they have made they have made a guideline also recently it was published and uh, they started uh, have started awarding fellowship also and uh, in uh, this uh, mycology fellowship those who are interested they can join and they can do that course and they can get the fellowship also so ecmm fellowship they are saying that is called and uh, they also have centers established centers throughout the world that can apply for ecm excellence center status if you work as per their guidance and uh, they way they want to educate they will educate and they will guide you how to implement various programs so all these three initiatives have shared a common ambition and the aim at improving outcome of fungal disease through guiding experts and patients towards excellence and acknowledging this fungal infection as a global problem all three initiative have explicitly reached out beyond these european borders and although i know recently i was talking to Elie Zoli, he said, uh, we want to extend it to India also, if you people are interested, because he is one of the person who is actually heading this. So I was sitting with Dr. Arunalok Chakravarti, he is uh, my very good friend, and he is, uh, as you know, that he is dying in fungal infection in our country, he represents the entire world. He also said, we will we'll develop our own program rather than following this Western world. So this is all about this uh, optimization. Thank you very much.